We are going to be in Isaiah chapter 7. Kara, you're the only one with a marker in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, because I was standing back there and I opened it up and I stuck a marker in there, so everybody else has to find it, and I can't remember the page. 483. Okay, page 483. Isaiah 7, page 483. <clears throat> um, Isaiah 7 is, the reason we're in Isaiah 7 uh, under the theme or the banner of hope this morning is because for what? 488. Page 488, okay. Uh, is because of what was read earlier for the lighting of the Advent candle from Matthew chapter 1 where Matthew as an interlude in a part of his story says now all this took place to fulfill what Isaiah the prophet said um, Let's see, this is the year 734 in Isaiah chapter 7. 734 years prior to what we're going to, or prior to what uh, was read earlier in Matthew, uh, we're going to deal with this morning from Isaiah chapter 7. And the theme of hope plays out as we read the first two verses of Isaiah 7 and we get some historical background. It says, now came about in the day of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, the Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of the people of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. This is a picture from the ancient uh, Near East of two mighty nations ready to wage war against a smaller nation. And in the background of all of this, and we'll see that as we approach the end of the chapter, there is a whole other kingdom which has grown very large teeth um, just outside of the immediate picture here. Aram would be modern-day Syria. Um, Israel, uh, you kind of say, you know, tongue-in-cheek, modern-day Israel, and yet Judah is also a picture of this, and they're modern-day Israel. So we're looking at uh, three kingdoms here, um, the kingdom of Israel not being very much larger, though a little bit larger than San Luis Obispo County, and uh, Judah being uh, about the size of San Luis Obispo County, of which approximately half the bottom part uh, would be called the Negev, uh, semi-arid, uh, you consider mostly mostly land that you wouldn't want to go farming or ranching on, but nevertheless, there it is. Um, by this time, Judah has been weakened um, enough because King Uzziah, had, who was Ahaz's grandfather, had died. King Uzziah's kingdom was massive. Uh, under King Uzziah, he had as much of the promised land that God had promised Abraham as had ever been uh, up to this point. And under Solomon, it was about the same size. Under King Uzziah, he had pushed the borders out. And it was a, it was a massive kingdom, a lot of tribute paid, a lot of uh, warriors, a lot of economic growth. And under King Uzziah, the nation had worshipped God. Uh, Jotham had come along, Uzziah's son, and he was, for the most part, a good guy. Uh, the problem with Jotham ha had been that even though he worshipped God, he never, as we would term it today, he never went to church. Uh, very clearly stated that he never walked into the temple of God. It's kind of like, huh? 
And today, I don't know whether to make this a part of the sermon. I guess I am because I've started. Um, how many people do we know who claim to be Christians and yet to never darken the door of a church? And you just kind of look at them and go, you know, where's the beef? Um, okay, whatever. I mean, I can't sit here and argue with you. But so, and Jotham, he, he did a good job. And, and apparently he loved God and yet he never walked through the doors of the temple. And you kind of go, eh, don't get it. And the result of that we find in Ahaz's life, the son of Jotham, the grandson of Uzziah. Ahaz was one nasty, awful, horrible person. Um, he wasn't that great a king to begin with, but secondly, he didn't just not go to church, he closed the doors of the temple. And he made altars uh, to Baal. He, uh, if I remember correctly, he made his own sons pass through the fire, which simply means that he had embraced paganism to the place of child sacrifice. And so we, we have this picture of this king of Judah, Ahaz being... Uh, I can't tell you which great uh, grandson he was of King David, but here he is of the progeny of the line of David, and he basically goes to God and embraces every type of pagan thing that he can possibly embrace. And he slams the door of the temple shut. And before he does that, he takes the instruments, the goodies of the temple, and he uh, breaks them up to, uh, well mostly for tribute, because we find that he made some pretty poor decisions as a king. One of them was when he looked north and he saw that Pekah, the king of Israel, which was at this time more powerful than Judah, and then above him, Syria or Aram, um, the, the king Rezin, uh, they both joined forces in order to come down and get a, a, a rich crop. That is to say, get uh, this kingdom of Judah, which was ripe for the picking in their eyes. And he looks north and he sees those two joining forces. And so what he does, he goes to uh, the king of Assyria, which at this time was like the 13-year-old uh, <clears throat> bully uh, in the neighborhood who's just coming into his own and you realize that in a couple years, if you feed this kid uh, the wrong information, he's going to grow into a bigger bully. And so he, um, that's Assyria. He, he pulls uh, on, the, uh, on the robe of Assyria and said, hey, can you help out? And Assyria kind of looks at him with that, <laughs> you bet. Uh, not the, oh yeah, but the, <laughs> you bet. Uh, Assyria, Assyria will show up. But at this point, in, in verses 1 and 2, we have um, Rezin, who, by the way, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, Rezin, the king of Aram. He is going to be the last king of Aram, the last king of Syria. Uh, not forever, uh, but the last king of Aram, as we, as we will refer to the kingdom of, of Aram. Uh, because he's going to be killed, and uh, basically Aram's going to disappear off, off the map. This is the last of the Aramites. Um, Pika is a usurper of the throne of Israel, and uh, he and Aram join forces to get Judah in order, in my opinion, to form a bigger kingdom to be able to stand up against the growing bully of Assyria. So Ahaz, who has absolutely no spiritual connection with the God of Israel, uh, shakes in his boots. And the description that Isaiah gives is the hearts, his heart, uh, Ahaz's heart, and the hearts of the people shook as trees in the forest under the wind. So there's great fear in, in Judah. And the time has come in their estimation that they're, go uh, they're going to be annihilated. That's what they're trying to prevent. Um, so we get into the next section where uh, God shows up uh, to his prophet Isaiah, and he's going to talk to Isaiah in order to talk to Ahaz. And this is the first of, uh, 
of two in here that we're going to find. Verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Jashin, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, the fuller being the laundryman, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin uh, and Aram and the son of Romalia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Romalia has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up now against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set, on, uh, set up the sons of Tabeel as king, as, uh, sorry, the son of Tabeel, as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Romalia. If you do not believe, you surely shall not last. All right, so what do we have here? We have God showing up, speaking to Isaiah, in order to speak to Ahaz. And he says to Isaiah, go get your son, Shir Jashub. And uh, Shir Jashub means a remnant shall return. So as Isaiah shows up, and Isaiah has, has not been shy about speaking already truth. And usually truth when spoken uh, may not be pretty. But because God is merciful, God always says, hey, bad stuff's going to happen, but here I am. Just worship me and things will turn out uh, better. So Isaiah's coming, a speaker of truth, and he's bringing his son, which could be translated in all of this as a, a picture of hope. A remnant shall return. So as soon as you see the word remnant, and it looks like the whole place is going to be coming down, God says, no, there's going to be a remnant. It's like, oh, so there's... There's light at the end of the tunnel is what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So God calls Isaiah and his son to come to Ahaz and in essence say there's light at the end of the tunnel. And as he does so, he, uh, he says, don't be afraid. That's what he says in verse 4 because of the two, these two stubs of smoldering firebrands. So here you have this huge fire, this massive fire, a bonfire. And what God says is, in essence, this is not a bonfire. These are two little tiny firebrands, you know, with little, little red on the end. There we go. All taken care of. That's how God describes these two mighty kings up north, Aram and uh, Israel, who is referred to as Ephraim. Uh, and there's history on that. Ephraim is the largest uh, tribe of the northern tribes. And oftentimes, Israel will be referred to as Ephraim. It's not a slam, um, but it's almost as if it, you know, your name is Hope. Okay, You're, you've been given the name Hope. And you always walk around like Eeyore. Oh, it's all going to fall apart. <laughs> so, I mean, you kind of go, eh? And Israel's name means prince with God. And, you know, here they are not even acknowledging God. So it's kind of like, eh, we'll call you Ephraim. So um, God says, hey, take care. Don't be calm. You know, it's going to be okay because these two things are going to be snuffed out. Uh, they're all, you know, all hype. They're all fierce anger. They're all coming down. They've uh, talked evil. They've, they've trash talked to you. They say, hey, let's go up to Jerusalem. Go down to Judah. We're going to... Uh, smash down the walls, we're going to go in, we're going to remove the heart, that is the king uh, uh, of David's lineage, and we're going to put in this son of Tabeel. And I couldn't find that Tabeel was a person or a place, a region. So what they were going to do is they were going to do what oftentimes happened. They, put, they would put in a puppet state, so you'd have mighty king, mighty king, and then puppet state, which would serve the mighty kings. And this would be then a great package deal to fight against Assyria down the road. But God says, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, verse 8, the head of Aram is Damascus, the head of Damascus is Rezin. So Rezin's the king. I'm going to snuff him out. 
And in 65 years, and it seems, and I, I can't quite figure out whether this, uh, it's a parenthesis in the New American Standard, is it a parenthesis in the NIV? This next part that says, now within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered. No? Okay. All right, so we'll just continue it on as uh, this is a part of it. In 65 years, what is now the northern kingdom of Israel, in 65 years, they're going to be so shattered, you're really not going to find any remnants. It's like going out into the, uh, you know, in the old days, they just threw the uh, pottery shards in with the, uh, the toilet. And you go out there eventually and you try to place a, a broken pottery back together. It doesn't really work because you can't find all the pieces. And that's what God is saying here, that in 65 years, um, Ephraim is going to be so shattered you can't put it back together. And there's a bunch of history involved in that. Uh, we're in seven... 722 BC, um, Assyria comes and conquers Samaria and uh, takes them away. But in 699, uh, Assyria comes back, takes more out, and transplants more. So it's kind of like you, you go back to look for um, what you would call the, the Hebrew people, the Jews, the Israelites, and it's like, oh, yeah, I know that one, they live down the road there. You know, right at the uh, section there. Oh, yeah, and there's another one over here. And here is, is their former land where everywhere you look, yeah, they're all, this is us. Instead, now it's like, yeah, there's one over there, there's one over there. So God shows up to Ahaz, and he says, this isn't going to be a problem. In just a, a few years down the road, there's not going to be anything left. And the last thing he says in verse 9 is, if you won't believe this, you, you've got a problem. I mean, you're going to have a problem. And think about that for a moment, because the message really is about hope this morning. Uh, God shows up to a, a godless man, um, and he makes a promise to this guy. He says, have hope, I'm here. And in that, he says, if you don't believe this, you're going to have more problems than you've got in, in proverbially, you can shake a stick at. So that's how that part ends. Then we move on to the second part in verse 10 through verse 16. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. All right, we stop there for just a moment. Because you have to, uh, again, recognizing that Ahaz, and I don't, I don't even know why God said, uh, the Lord your God. I, I, because Ahaz shined God on. He is not an atheist by any stretch of the imagination, because he has lots of gods. And he has chosen, and, and this is where you take personal responsibility for your own choices. He has chosen to reject God. I've slammed the door in the temple. Uh, places that should we, we should be going to go to Yahweh, we bypass in order to go to Baal or somebody else at this altar or this altar or this altar instead of the one in the temple. Ask a sign for yourself. Now, when, when it says here as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven, it, it doesn't mean, you know, let's build a tower of Babel and, and that'll be the sign, or let's dig uh, and see if we can find uh, that ancient place called China. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about as, as much as you can possibly think of, that's what I would do for you. So ask away. And then you stop to think of what Ahaz could have asked. Now, now stop for a minute. Just think of this. Okay, Ahaz is sitting there and he's thinking, make an axe head float. <laughs> oh yeah, I've already done that. Now ask something else. Okay. Make a dead child rise from the dead. Yeah, I've done that one too. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know. This is make the Jordan River split in two so I can walk across on dry land. Oh yeah, I've done that more than once. Hmm. All right. Let me watch somebody ascend up into the sky in a whirlwind. Yeah, I've done that one. I mean, God says, ask whatever you will. No holds barred. Now, if God came to you and said, ask whatever you will, ask whatever you will, 
and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. Make an axe head float. Yeah. Piece of cake. Watch this. There it is. And by the way, if you don't know that story, read about Elijah. Yeah, Elisha. It's fun. Elisha. It, it's a fun story. It's a good story. So we get then to verse 12, and Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And I can come back to now and say, if God said to you, ask a sign for yourself, and I'll show you to prove myself. My response is, you're the Lord God of heaven. If you said it, I believe it. So I'm good. So in other words, if I said it, you would, and, I, and then I told you, you would say, well, that makes sense because you preached to us about the, uh, the sacrifice and the resurrection and the coming of the Lord, and, and you believe it because it's in here and God said it, so you believe it. That would make sense. As we look at it here, that's not what's happening. Ahaz is not a pious man. He, in essence, and this is what blows me away, is saying, I'm not interested. Take your silly magic tricks and, you know, go sell them on the street corner or something. I'm not interested. So we look at that and we do not want to be fooled by, the, by how we might say it today as people who look at the Word of God and embrace it. Now, they look at the response that God says in verses 13 and 14. Then he said, listen now, O house of David. And he's talking specifically to him as a as a progeny of uh, a great, 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 great grandson of, of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Are you kidding me? My translation. <laughs> Verse 14, therefore, and, and this is, would be Isaiah looking right in the face of the king of Israel, saying, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, a virgin will be with child, will bear a son. She will call his name God with us. In the midst of hopeless situations, and there's been a few that I've been in, I look for God's presence. And if in some way, whether it be a person or the presence of the Holy Spirit or a scripture verse, I say, God, I feel like a, like a roadkill, but I know you're here and therefore I look into your face and I embrace you. You are my hope. That is amazing in a topsy-turvy world. Here, God says, you won't ask? I'm going to give you one anyway. A virgin's going to uh, uh, conceive and give birth, and, and the child's name will be called God with us. And it's like, whew, cool. So we'll know at least part of this fulfilled in about nine months, approximately. Verses 15 and 16 conclude this. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So how, how old is this by the, child, uh, by the time a child is able to look at you when you say no and turn and do it anyway? You know, how old is that? Uh, anywhere, I mean, I look at my own children, <clears throat> anywhere from one-year-old to two, somewhere in there. Um, so in anywhere from the nine months uh, plus a year, so anywhere from a year and nine months to about three years. So within three years' time, the two kings, Rezin and Pika, are going to be pff, history, snuffed out, <sighs> all gone. Now, if you're the king of Israel, or of Judah, and God tells you that, and you're fearful, and you look north, and God tells you that within three years, and you're going to know this, uh, because you're going to become aware of this child called Emmanuel, 
Within three years, those two guys are going to be long gone. What do you do? Well, you know, if it's us, hopefully we learn, we bow the knee, we worship, and we get on the right track. Ahaz, Ahaz is not that man. He's just not, and it's terribly sad. Okay, I've got to rush through this next part, and I, I can do it. <laughs> so we begin in verse 17. The Lord will bring on you, uh, on your people, and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Syria. Okay, so since the time that Jeroboam uh, took the ten tribes and made their own kingdom uh, from Rehoboam, the uh, grandson of, of King David, since that time, there's gonna, not going to be any more trouble than you've ever seen between them, which would be about... I'm just roughly going to say 900 B.C. to now, which is 734 B.C. You haven't seen that kind of trouble in the last 150 years. And it's going to be the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria, ah, he's my friend. He's the guy that I asked. Yeah, not a, not a smart move on your part. Uh, and it will come about in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the uh, rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So you've got the Egyptians from the south, numerous, like flies, and you've got the uh, bees of Assyria coming down again, only this time uh, there's not as many, but they sting. Flies land on you and they're, they're, they're annoying, but bees sting you and it's more than annoying. So you, you've got this double whammy and there's this whole bit of history I'm not going to share this morning. There's a huge battle eventually that takes place. Um, and it's somewhere close to Judah. Uh, and I can't remember where specifically. But Egypt and uh, Assyria uh, butt heads. And uh, of course it doesn't end well for, for Egypt. And they will all come and settle on the steep ravines, on the ledges of the cliffs, and on all the thorn bushes, and on uh, the watering places. In other words... You're going to have Egyptians and you're going to have Assyrians all over your land. It's, and who wants foreigners running around in, in, your, in your land? I mean, running around, foreign soldiers, sorry, not foreigners, foreign soldiers. All right, uh, quickly, verse 20, and, in that, um, and in, in that day the Lord will shave with a razor hired from regions beyond the Euphrates, that is, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. This shaving is a sign of, of uh, either distress and remorse or of 100% uh, humiliation. So if an emissary comes to a king and says, hey, we, we want to make peace, and the king goes, and you go home, <laughs> you're totally bald, uh, that's a sign of, of a, you're, we don't like you. <laughs> Pretty easy. Uh, otherwise, you do that also when you're... Uh, extreme distress. So in other words, it's not good either way you look at it. And then 21 through the end, now it will come about in that day that a man will keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep, and it will happen that because of the abundance of the milk produced, he will eat curds, for everyone that is left within the land will eat curds and honey. This sounds really good. It's like, honey, man, I love that. Put it on my peanut butter sandwich. We've got some good stuff. Well, that's all fine and good. But why is there so much milk? And why is there so much honey? It's because there's no little sheep to suck the mothers. And there's an abundance of milk. And pretty much that's all you've got. That and the, the wild bees, there's so much uh, going on that the wild bees have come in and, and you've got a wild bees' nest. And we find out why in the following verses. Um, Verse 23, and it, come, and it will come about in that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines, valued a thousand shekels of silver, will become briars and thorns. People will come there with bows and arrows because all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills which used to be cultivated with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place for pasturing oxen and sheep to trample. In other words, all your cultivated orchards and all your cultivated uh, vineyards and all your cultivated wheat, um, it's all gone. It's just wild. It's crazy. It's wild. So what 
God has done here in all of this, and then I'm going to get to Matthew in just a moment. Uh, God has given us a picture here, the historical picture. It's really bad news for Judah. God shows up and says, hey, don't worry. Look at me. Ask a sign. I, I'll tell you, within, uh, within t- two to three years, it's all going to be done. With 65 years, they're going to be gone. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't want... Yeah, I'm not... Yeah. No. Mm, then I'm going to give you a sign. Now, we understand the initial completion of this prophecy. Within, three, within uh, a year, there's going to be a child born of somebody who had been a virgin, unmarried, and, uh, and she bears a child, and he's born. The family names him Emmanuel. By the time he's one to two years old, all this stuff's going to be gone. So pay attention. But because you're not, we've got issues. All your land, you see all this, all these vineyards? It's all going to be briars. Because there's no, nobody going to be left to tend them. Um, it's all going to be, if you have cows and sheep, they're going to pasture in all of this. You're not going to be able to grow anything. You're not going to have the manpower. You're not going to have the ability. Uh, you're going to be overrun. And it's not going to be good. This is a message of hope. So, Matthew chapter 1, we get this amazing chapter 1, and I'm only going to, uh, I'm going to conclude with Matthew. Um, Matthew tells us the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. And of course, in all our translations, it's now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And it's Jesus the Messiah. And he goes through and he talks about Mary, he talks about Joseph, and then he comes to uh, verse 23 of Matthew 1, and he says, uh, well, I'm sorry, 22 and 23. Uh, Matthew tells us this all took place, what I'm sharing with you about the Virgin Mary and her uh, engaged husband. It's the equivalent of all the, <clears throat> the marriage vows having been said without the actual coming together. And just odd to me in this society where you become engaged and then you get, do the marriage vows and then you live together. Well, it's like, it kind of works that way. You do the marriage vows in essence, but you don't live together. It's like, okay, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how that really works well, but that's the way it worked. And I guess that was so that there was now just the time when they both prepared for the time when they actually do come together. And when the husband was ready, he showed up and he showed up and got the bride and they, they came here. So they were married without this, without the, uh, the privileges. And, and he says, now this all took place that, uh, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet doesn't say Isaiah, but that's where we find it, might be fulfilled. So Matthew says that the ultimate fulfillment of that passage, of that statement, yes, it had an immediate fulfillment, but it was fulfilled in verse 23. Uh, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son. They will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So here we are today in the 21st century. Two millennia since, that, since Matthew wrote this and almost another millennia since Isaiah said it. So here we are in human history and the end result of all of this is that we sit, stand, unite here today under the banner of hope, looking at the light Looking forward to the second advent because we get to look back upon the first advent, which Matthew talks about here. And we end up with all this hope within us in reliance upon the one who has said, I've got it. I've got it under control. It's under control. It's in my time. Just keep watching. Just keep watching for me. So this Christmas, we celebrate... Not a Christmas tree, not a Christmas present, not Santa Claus, but we celebrate with hope in our hearts, looking back upon the first advent, looking forward 
to the second advent. And we of all people ought to be people who are people of hope. And we, because of that, we get to rejoice. Amen. Father, you are so good to us, and we rejoice greatly this morning. We rejoice in hope. You are the God of hope. You have given us hope. We have a living hope. We walk in that hope, even as we look down the road to what you have for us. Father, may our walk be clean and pure this week as we anticipate the uh, celebration of the first Christmas when all this came to pass. Lord, we just rejoice because there's great reason to rejoice. Receive our rejoicing this morning as worship, and we give it to you freely because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.